All right, tough times here, Dr. Bob. Got a lot of free time on my hands. The uh, coronavirus epidemic has sort of shut me down for the next week. Uh, state of Alaska doesn't want me to see patients for two weeks because I traveled out of state. I was down in Montana working in the ER. Um, I was very careful. I wore a, a N95 mask on all the airline flights and every patient encounter, but the government has uh, requested that we not see patients, so I canceled my four clinic patients for the week and uh, can't work in the urgent care this week. I will have to go to Cordova and work next week because that small hospital will basically shut down if I don't show up. So uh, we'll have to not follow the government plea uh, for that. And then when I get back, I'll be able to do urgent care, but they've asked that uh, non-essential uh, routine medical care uh, be withheld for a while. And I think uh, our annual exams and elite health evaluations fall into that category. I'm still able to do lab follow-up over the phone. But anyways, rather than try to write about uh, my thoughts about uh, this uh, epidemic and what we might do to mitigate the risk to ourselves, uh, I thought I'd uh, start trying to do a video blog. So, <clears throat> Um, basically, there's two things you can do. One is not get the virus, and the other is be able to handle the virus if you do contract it. I have nothing to add to what the government is uh, implying is the best strategy to not get the virus. Um, I think the social distancing makes complete sense, and important hand hygiene is uh, certainly reasonable. Um, if you do go out where you are inadvertently unable to um, meet the social distancing standards, a mask does appear to be helpful. I'm not gonna say much more about preventing getting the virus. There's nothing you can do. If you get the virus, you get the virus. What can we do if we get the virus? What can we do now to decrease the risk of a bad outcome if we get the virus. Well, you guys know that I think knowledge is power and I think it's important for you guys to understand how this virus is harming people. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of what I understand is going on that's causing problems. And so I've done a little fairly simple diagram that I hope you guys can see well enough. I'm not a professional videographer and this is a smartphone trying to do this. At the top of this diagram you see in green, which is also the color I'm using for actionable things, is lifestyle treats everything. And this is a very simple diagram of basically physiology. This drawing right here is the lungs basically an air exchange device. The lungs primary function is to oxygenate the blood. Now, we know that people that are old are having more problems with COVID-19 when they get infected, as are those with lung disease. Your lungs can only work so good and it's a combination of age-related decline, plus whatever you've done to damage them through your life. And this is probably not an area of great action, okay? Now, from the lungs, which put oxygen in the blood, we have pipes that go to a pump, the heart. Now, again, we know that people with heart disease are having a hard time with COVID-19. The pump, though, is somewhat actionable. As we age, our pump function declines. And depending on your genetics and how well you've taken care of yourself, your fitness level, your pump function is what it is right now. But we can have an effect on that and we'll talk about that later. Then we have pipes that go from the pump to the target organs, the body, kidneys, brain, muscles, everything. So the objective is for the air exchanger to put oxygen 
into the blood, the blood which also carries nutrients, controlled by that hole in your face, by the way, to the pump, where the pump then pumps the oxygenated blood to the target organ. Okay, now, the target organs need oxygen and nutrients. And if they don't get enough oxygen and nutrients, evil humors begin to occur. Bad things build up in the blood and cellular function declines further. But what's happening in COVID-19? Oh, got ahead of myself. The valve. The valve concept I want you to grasp is that your blood vessel walls or linings are actually like valves. They can leak fluid. They can leak other molecules. That valve is controlled by three things. In other words, whether leak fluid is going to start to leak or not is determined by three factors. One is the hydrostatic pressure in the tube. Okay, big word, but fairly, most people probably understand that. How much pressure is in the tube? If the pressure in the tube exceeds a certain amount, fluid's going to leak through the valve into various places. It turns out, as the pump function worsens, the pressure in the tubes tend to increase. So people with heart disease have higher pressure in this tube that goes from the lungs to the heart, okay? Second thing that controls the valve, oncotic pressure. That's a concept where there are molecules in the blood that hold on to fluid, that make the fluid want to stay in the vessel. The main molecule responsible for this is a protein called albumin, okay? So albumin is in the fluid. And if there's enough of it, we have good oncotic pressure, tends to want to hold on to the fluid. The third thing that makes the valve leaky is inflammation. And as you see, I have all three of these things targeted because as I told you, we can have some effect on the pump. Guess what that's gonna be? You guessed it, exercise, our activity level. We can have some effect on oncotic pressure because we are able to eat a high protein diet, which probably helps keep our albumin levels up. And we can certainly have some effect on inflammation. And again, you guys know that exercise reduces inflammation and so does a proper diet and a proper omega balance, which we're gonna spend time talking about. And then I've got another thing in green down here, immune function, because there are things we can do that will help our body to improve immune function. We'll come back to that in a little bit. All right, back to the pathophysiology of COVID-19 and why people are dying. I told you, your lungs can only function as however good they function for the most part. Probably not very actionable. As you age, the elasticity of your lungs declines, so old people's lungs don't work as good. As I told you, the pump declines as we age. Though the more fit you are, the better your pump works. If you haven't had a heart attack, the better your pump works. But old people with heart disease and a declining pump are more susceptible to this process, okay? And then people with chronic diseases that cause a lot of systemic inflammation are gonna have leaky valves, okay? Plus higher pressure. What happens? Well, here's what happens. I already told you, you need this system to deliver oxygen to the targets or the evil humors build up. Well, if the pump's already weak, and the pressure's already high in the pipe, and the valve's already leaky because you have a little inflammation, and you get this virus which causes an inflammatory reaction, and you have poor omega balance. You're shifted towards the inflammation side of the equation. When your white blood cells respond to this infection, they start to pour out inflammatory compounds instead of a mixture of inflammatory and inflammatory compounds. They call this the cytokine storm, okay? Now the valve becomes even leakier. 
okay? So what happens is the pressure in this pipe gets very high and the valve starts to leak fluid into the lungs, which is why we run out of ventilators. Because these people that are getting sick, their lungs are filling up with fluid. Now guess what happens if we take up a bunch of this airspace with fluid? Air exchange worsens. Less oxygen is in the blood. So even if the pump's still functioning as well as it was before the virus hit, we're not delivering as much oxygen to the target tissues and we get more evil humors building up in the bloodstream. And this vicious cycle is going to occur because as these evil humors build up, cellular function declines, the pump starts pumping worse, the pressure gets higher, the fluid fills up, and eventually, even on a ventilator, they may not be able to exchange enough air to keep you functioning. Does that explain it? Is it a little bit clearer now why old people and sick people are the ones that are being compromised to the point where they're needing medical care? I hope so. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about how to affect the different things. Okay, well, we'll start with the pump because everybody knows I'm an exercise guy. Okay, so we're all stuck inside now. I'm fortunate I've got a little bit of a home gym. I'll keep training about like I always do. I've got three pieces of stationary equipment and I've got enough weightlifting equipment that it's not going to affect my training lifestyle much at all. But we're not moving around as much. There's a tendency to sit. Don't sit, stand. You know what, you can watch TV and stand. If you're working from home, you can stand. Standing is better for you than sitting. Sitting is the new smoking. I've got the scientific studies. My next wellness blog on Facebook will cover some of the sitting versus standing mortality studies. Um, obviously, if you're going to jump to the most extreme version of cardiovascular fitness that's going to have the best effect on the pump, and potentially reduce the hydrostatic pressure on this side of the pump. Intervals, sprint interval training. You can accomplish it standing still in a room. You don't even need a piece of equipment. You can do high knees, running as hard as you can for until you're gassed. Um, but if you can't go to that extreme and you're allowed outside, go walk. Get outside and let some sunlight hit you. Get some oxytocin going. Outside makes us feel better. So I encourage you, if, you're if your city's still allowing you to be outside to have activity, get outside and walk. Um, you could get a P90X video or an insanity video, which I've done, stationary training that's high intensity. If you've got a piece of stationary equipment and you're watching a lot of TV with the family, maybe walk on it. Do anything to keep this pump function going. All right, so exercise because it makes sense. What about the oncotic pressure? You need some protein, okay? Not only will protein help you maintain your albumin, pro which I should mention that one of the things that's happening in this cascade of events that's resulting in this deterioration of people's physiology to the point where they're dying, is there tends to be a significant drop in albumin in these people that are not doing well. Something is happening in the overall scheme of things with this inflammatory insult from the virus where the kidneys start to leak the albumin, a thing we call proteinuria. So their albumin levels start to drop and the oncotic pressure drops. That's probably related to the inflammation that damages the kidneys. Hopefully we're not going to have inflammation in those of us that get it because we're going to pay attention to what we can do about inflammation. But anyways, I think a high protein, clean high protein diet makes a lot of sense in this setting. The other thing is I think protein is probably clearly involved in immune function. 
Most of your immune function is related to the ability to produce antibodies. Antibodies are molecules produced by white blood cells after they recognize a, an infectious agent that, that attach to the infectious agent and help the body attack and destroy the infectious agent. And what do you think they're made of? Amino acids, about 110 to 130 amino acids. What are amino acids in? Protein. So eat your lean meats, eat your fish, okay? Eat some good high quality vegetable protein. Get your protein intake up. It's important right now. All right? We're going to jump to inflammation. What's the most important thing I can think of to reduce your inflammation? Put the right stuff in your body. Exercise reduces inflammation, but the hole in your face is what's primarily responsible for your inflammation balance. Omega-3 fish oils. Highly concentrated, molecularly distilled, Almost all ALA and I'm sorry, almost all DHA and EPA from a high quality source that is not oxidized, molecularly distilled so it's not full of mercury, and most importantly, uh, independent third party tested so you know you're getting the high quality omega 3s that will help shift your cell wall composition to more omega-3s than omega-6s, so that when your white blood cells respond to this insult of this virus, you're not overwhelmed with inflammatory compounds that start this whole cascade that I'm talking about. What's the other thing you can do? Cut down on omega-6s. Let's not have a wheat-based diet right now. Let's not eat a ton of corn. Let's not be cooking in corn oil. Let's get our healthy fats. Thinking of that, the vegetable fats have another important omega-3 fatty acid, ALA, and it's high in things like chia seeds and hemp seeds and flax seeds. So let's get that in our body. And while we're at it, though not structural, the monounsaturated fats like olive oil and avocado oil are also important for the health of our blood vessels. So. Let's get some of that in our body while we're at it. Okay, so we're gonna cut down on grains. We're going to increase the omega-3 intake through fish oil, and you can also eat fish. It's a good source of protein, and it's got the omega-3s. Smash, salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Those five fish relatively inexpensive other than the salmon, have high amounts of omega-3s and the protein that you need. So think about eating as much fish as you can right now, a fair amount anyways. Um, fruits and vegetables. We know that fruits and vegetables are full of antioxidants, um, micromolecules that are important in cellular function. And it makes sense to eat as many vegetables as you can and at least a few servings of low glycemic fruit daily. Gotta avoid sugar. Sugar's inflammatory all by itself. Sugar gums up the works. As sugar levels rise, sugar, glucose, attaches to all of your protein structures in your body that make your cells work right. A process we call glycation. So let's avoid sugar. All right, I think I've got most of what I wanted to talk about from a dietary perspective. Certainly some of those micronutrients are gonna help with immune function. Um, the, uh, the immune function, the other thing I guess that I, I, I feel like is really important for immune function is a high quality probiotic. One that is deliverable live to the intestine that is comprised of proven bacterial strains that help make the microbiome healthy. Um, and so basically, I like the Synogenics probiotic because it's individually encapsulated uh, in a acid-resistant outer coating 
with a high quality mixture of probiotic organisms that have been proven to repopulate the intestinal tract. And each probiotic capsule is in a nitrogen filled blister pack that is foil so sunlight can't damage it. In other words, the organisms when you take them are still alive. You know, probiotics are anaerobes, meaning they can't survive in oxygen. So when you buy a bottle of probiotics and there's 30 of them and it tells you to refrigerate them, there's a reason for that. Once you open the bottle, the other 29 capsules are dying. Ideally, a good probiotic should be individually sealed, each capsule it should have a special resistant outer coating and it should be comprised of a high colony count of beneficial organisms. Now, why do probiotics make your immune function work well? I don't understand the pathophysiology. This is the new frontier in medicine, but it's quite clear that the domains that are most affected by probiotic are gut health and immune function, and particularly resistance to viral disease. So I think those are the things that I've identified that we can do. Um, a few other things, uh, I guess you can't get Zycam right now. Zinc has been pretty good at showing some evidence that it helps us fight off these common colds. And coronavirus is a cold virus. You know, zinc's high in uh, um, pumpkin seeds. I eat pumpkin seeds every day. They got a lot of protein for a seed. They got some healthy fat. They've got some fiber, not a bad way to go. But let me think, is there anything else I want to preach? I guess for now we'll call it good. I hope this helps a little bit. I hope you've got a little bit better understanding of why this disease is targeting old people, what the cascade of events are that leads to um, fluid buildup in the lungs and ultimately inability of the body to deliver the important nutrients and oxygen to the target tissues, which then eventually results in our metabolic collapse and death. Why we're going to have a shortage of ventilators if this hits too fast. Why it's getting old people because we already have poor lung function, our pump is not as good. Um, other disease diseases, diabetes, they always, diabetics have high sugar poor immune function. Um, let's keep the protein intake up. Let's eat those healthy foods, fruits and vegetables. Get the omega balance in the right direction. Supplements, probiotics. Oh, vitamin D. Vitamin D definitely affects immune function. Vitamin D is obviously very important for overall cellular function. Um, so my big three on supplements are going to be your fish oil, your probiotic, Vitamin D with K2. Um, my most important nutritionary, nutrition advice is going to be keep your protein intake up and make sure that you cut down on sugars, stay off a of grain so we don't drive that inflammatory balance the direction opposite we want to. Um, keep your vegetable intake up for antioxidants and your fruit at a reasonable amount for antioxidants and let's stay as active as we can. You got a chance to spend a lot of time with your family, get your kids exercising, don't let them sit and play games all day long, stand when you can, walk when you can, get outside when you can. I'm gonna call that a wrap. I hope you guys enjoyed it, thanks.